from our uh, from our, our, our release that we can use relays of um, you know varying values um, <clears throat> in our system. So there wouldn't be any need to um, have a whole scale changing of your CTs if you are changing technologies. And I believe I mentioned the fact that you're moving from electromagnetic relays um, now to microprocessor, microprocessor relays. The, the burden in terms of the burden impedance um, for those relays are significantly different. And so, um, you know, in the case of our own utility, they, if it necessitated changing SETs, then they would have had um, an, a lot of uh, upgrades. But given um, that value of the burden impedance, you can use CTs of um, various uh, burdens. And then we, the third thing we mentioned, which is what I'm going to spend a little time this afternoon looking at, is the whole business of the errors associated with the CTs. I would say that the ratio and phase angle errors um, can be calculated if the magnetizing current characteristics and the burden impedances, uh, burden impedance are known. So, coming now to the world business of um, errors, we have here that the secondary current, yes, of course that's a vector, is equal to your primary minus what goes um, through the excitation. Winding. So, it's a vector, um, some that we're looking at. So, just going back to the, just going back to the to the to the to the figure um, with our CT. So, what we're looking at this is IP. That's IS, and that's IE. So, we're just applying Kirchhoff's current law. Like that that's all we're doing, right? And we're saying that IP um, is equal to IE plus IS. But remember, what we are interested in is what the relay will see. So we are interested in what goes to the secondary, which is the current that will then go through the relay. Is that clear? All right. So looking at IS and um, representing IS, IP, and IE, along with the uh, the associated voltages, we end up with this um, phase diagram. Now, this is a, this is in the notes that you you have, and I think you um, um, you can access those notes now, right? I'm I'm hoping that you have at least printed them and, and gone through them yeah, at least casually. So that you will recognize that not everything will have to be written here in the class. We can have more of a discussion. All right. So just for just for um, our purposes, we are looking at, at at the vector sum of I S and I E. So this would be I E. Yes, that's in parallel, of course, with the I E at the bottom there, and of course, um, closing that triangle, we have I P. Um, from IE, we have IR and IQ, yes, which are represented here. So we, we're just um, looking at the components um, of, of the vector. So we have the quadrature and the direct component. So the quadrature would be IQ, and of course, the direct there would be IR. And yeah, we, 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 we leave it at that. And of course, um, for the voltages, we have the secondary voltage, um, secondary induced voltage, which we know would have given us E, yes, and of course, I, I'm trying to, well, if you have, um, well, you may have seen this in, in, in machines, I don't know, but um, for your machines, you have VT being called the E minus um, IX, yeah, or E is equal to V um, plus um, I, I Z. Well, yeah. All right, so that, that's it. what we have here. So this would be your um, induced EMF. Of course, this would be your um, 
if you think of the generator that will be the terminal voltage, yes? And then um, the other things are there, or um, phase angle error, just the angular displacement between IS and IP. And of course, um, well, the, 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 we're doing this e, e versus phi, all right? So we have um, our IRX, IRS, which would be the, um, where you would have, let me just change the color of this, where you would have had, um, yeah, come on, you would have had IZ here. So that would be IZ. All right, so you'd have VS plus IZ is equal to IE, but of course, the Z will be made up of X and R, which is why we get those, those two components. All right, so that's your, um, sorry, uh, just allow me to take this place, my, my apology. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, my apologies. Da, 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 da. Got it. And that just disturbed my screen, right? Good. So there we are. Back again. All right. So any, any questions with respect to the, the phaser diagram? Because we're just going to make some references to um, the diagram in terms of speaking of the errors. And I want you to, while we go through this section, just keep in the back of your mind the fact that um, the CT, the primary uh, purpose, is to provide us with an, a, a, a replica, a scale replica of what's happening on the system. So if if we can reduce the distortion between what's on the system and what we see coming to the relay, then you know we can make more um, accurate decisions. All right? So keep that in the back of your head. So when we're looking at, um, at, at our, our, our um, Excuse me. The 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 secondary um, EMF, which is given, it, which is dependent, uh, which gives rise to IE. Yes, IE being the excitation current. Uh, so I have to be going back and forth, but of course the IE the. the yeah. The excitation current will be that, yes, which will then give rise to um, our secondary voltage, yes. All right. So that current flowing through that impedance gives us our ES. But of course, our ES is also equal to the voltage drop across that secondary section of the of the um, the, the, the circuit. All right, so coming back here. So we have ES, we have ES um, is equal to IS into ZS plus ZB. So the voltage across the secondary uh, is dependent on what is happening in the excitation winding. 
Okay? And we pull all of this together in a few. You have looked at it before, but you know, now that we are forced to um, go into details, I'm sure it will make a lot more sense in a few minutes. So that secondary um, voltage, TMF, um, is given by, by, by this equation, all right? Um, which is what we're showing um, in that diagram. Yeah? So ES is equal to um, IS times the sum of those. Fair enough? All right, continuing with the, with the CT arrows, we have what are known as, um, or what is known as the current or the ratio error. Right? And that's the difference between IP and IS and is equal to IR. Now, obviously, obviously, um, what we are showing here, we, we would not have a, 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 an algebraic sum, meaning the difference would not be algebraic. It would be a vector, vector is here because we have an angular displacement, but that angle is, is fairly small. So in terms of the current error, in terms of the current error, what we are looking at would be the difference between IP, which is the primary current, and the secondary current. Yes? Um, and that, as, as we said, is given by IR. So we are, we're making a number of assumptions here. Yes? Um, which is equal to IR. Again, that component of our IE, which is in phase with IS. So that's your current error. So when I speak of current error in the, in the tables, that's what we are referring to. We also look at, um, at the phase error. So we have the current error. We also have the phase error, which is now IQ. And IQ, as we said, would now be the quadrature value. So IQ, which is the quadrature component of um, IE, yes, or the component of IE, which is at right angles, that's our quad quadrature mean. Forgive me for insulting in intelligence, but anyway, it's at right angles with IS, and that gives the phase error, which is phi. So the, the larger the value of IQ, it means that the angular displacement between IS and IP would increase. All right. All right. So that's just uh, showing it again to, you know, for reference. Okay. Any, any, any questions? So we talk now about two errors, the phase error and the current error. Current error, does that by the IR, and our phase error, the angle phi. Current Phase error. Okay. All right. There are some other things that, that we know. Of course, not all of this would be um, available to you as the engineer because you are buying something off the shelf. Yes. Um, and, oh, I think I, I think I missed one button here. Yeah. But there's one that um, I have not mentioned. Just note this one. It's the composite error. Let's take a note of that. The composite error. The composite error, um, we refer to that as the RMS value, the RMS value of the difference the RMS value of the difference between the ideal secondary current and the actual secondary current. All right. So the difference between the ideal RMS value of the difference between the ideal secondary current and the actual secondary current. So for for your Standard CT, you'll be expecting five amperes, but the, the 
the output um, with the standard input, maybe 4.9. So the composite error would be 0.1. That's what we're saying. Okay. Um, now, continuing, the composite error also includes current and phase errors, as well as the impact of harmonics. So we are looking at the value, but it also consists of current and phase errors, as well as the impact of harmonics. So in other words, there are times when instead of specifying um, current error, which we just spoke of, which is IR, and also phase error, which is given by IQ or, 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 or theta, yes, we can speak of composite error, which is looking at the magnitude, which is the difference between the actual and the uh, idea, the current and phase errors, and also harmonics. All right, so we can either specify phase error, current error, or we can specify the composite error, which is looking at a combination of all three. All three meaning those including harmonics. Are you with me? All right, so having said all of that, we now move to talking about um, CT standards, yes? Uh, we're gonna look at CT standards. And there are two standards that, that we introduced, and I and I will declare upfront that the, the only reason I look at the British standard is, is that in many industries in Jamaica, um, we still have not uh, replaced a lot of the equipment that was operating um, years gone by. Most of the CTs that you're going to find with your uh, more modern equipment are going to be based on the American standard, all right? But we still do have some, some, uh, some BS um, CTs. And so most of what I'm gonna talk about is really for information and just in case you run into it in, in industry, all right? Okay, so for your British standards, a couple of things you need to know. For your measuring CTs, the information that you will get is as shown. So you first have what we refer to as the class. So we have class 0 0.1, 0.2.1, and of course, class one. And then within the table, what, we're, what we have is the percentage current error, which we mentioned earlier, the ratio error, yeah? At a percentage of rated current, all right? So these are the percentage of rated current. Yes, 10 up to 20% of rated current. These are now the um, current errors that you are going to see. You understand that? No one confuse you? No. Do I need to go point over again? Sir, one more time. All right. So at the top of the table, what you have here, these represent the percentage of rated current. All right, that's this. So the 10 up to 20, up, but not including 20, that's 10% up to 19.99% of rated current. Yes? And then 20 up to 100% of rated current. And then 100 up to 120 percent of rated current. What it says is that for a class one CT, the ratio error, the percentage ratio error, is plus or minus 0.25. Are you with me? If we're if we're operating 
at 100 uh, percent of rated current then it's up to 0.2 so in other words if you if you if you remember now this this these are measuring cities these are measuring cities and one of the things we need to bear in mind is that when you're dealing with measurements, in most instances, this is about money. Right? It's about money. So you want to be as accurate as possible. You don't want as the utility um, to, 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 to be rubbing. Well, <clears throat> we hope not. But anyway, uh, we as the utility don't want to be rubbing the customer. But at the same time, the customer which, which is which is amounting to the same thing. You don't want to be overcharged. All right? So you're putting in, and, and i give you a classic example. This is something that, that, that actually happened. Um, the, the, the OER, of course, the regulator, they deal with um, uh, complaints that come from customers. And someone from the OER uh, reached out to me because a chicken farmer, out in Clarendon, was having issues with the utility company by virtue of what they were being charged. What we found was that it was a, an issue with the CTs that were being used. So, what he was actually using was a little less than what um, was being recorded on the bill simply because the CETs were not the appropriate CETs for that purpose. You know what I mean? So he ended up paying more than, than, than not what, what, what you know, he should have just decided to be paying. But of course, it, it was his loss because it's his responsibility to um, invest in the appropriate CETs. So the errors that we are showing here, if you, if you were using a class one, yeah, then the error is 2%, um, up to 20% of, of rating. So if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a 100 to 5, a 1,000 to 5 CT, and I'm using it up to, up to 20%, what that means is that if the current that I am operating it with is in the region of 200 amperes, hmm? as, as a 1,000 to 5, if I'm using it up to 200 amperes, then, the error that I'm going to experience is about 2, 2%. Two if I'm using it on a 1,000 ampere system, yes, remember that we're dealing with a 1,000 to 5, if I'm using it on a 1,000 ampere system, then the error would be 1.5. But let us say, um, well, I don't know what sort of money people who, um, Operate chicken farms, me. Right? But let us say you are operating in a, a multi billion dollar industry. So you get a job in a multi billion dollar industry, and they are taking power from, from the JPS for grid. Obviously, well, not obviously, but let us assume it's a manufacturing entity. So they are, they, their consumption is going to be significant. All right, now, you will have to make the decision. If you're being asked to now look at the CTs that, 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 that would be needed for, for, for measuring, 1.5% in the scheme of things. If you are talking about marks for, for protection, it's not a big deal. All right, but we're talking about money, converting that now to money for a utility bill. It's a significant amount that the customer will have to pay. So the decision that you would make, possibly make, is that you will go for a class 0.1, which is going to give you an error of 0.2. Obviously, students, that the 0.1 is going to be a more expensive CT. But you would have to do the analysis and decide on the trade-off. 
from an engineering standpoint. The phase displacement, as we mentioned earlier, which is the angular displacement between ice and IP, they are shown. So for the 10 to 20, these are the phase displacements in minutes. Yes, of course, 60 minutes, like one degree. All right. So these are the displacements in, 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 in minutes, angular displacements, obviously. All right. So based on these measurements or on these CTs, these classes, we can determine what the phase error or phase displacement would look like or the current error. All right. Um, all right this is us, you know, uh, specifying about the, the burden that, that, that will be used. Okay, but there are two other classes. Um, the class three, yes, and the class five. And for this, you have 3% yeah, and 5% respectively, and 3 and 5. Good. And that's at 50 and 120%. So in other words, these, and, and in, the, in, the, in the bottom it tells you that the, the phase displacement are not specified. So obviously, these would be more off-the-shelf CTs. But you buy them understanding the implications, meaning they don't even bother to specify what the angular displacement will be. And also, they indicate, they, um, they only indicate relatively large um, current errors. All right? So it's off-the-shelf. But you know, based on the operations, if you are just interested in uh, getting a good idea of what is being consumed, then you'll go for a class three and a class five. But if it's going to come down you now where it impacts revenue, then we have another um, thing coming. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, this again is just, um, you know, the information regarding the standards in terms of how the information is, is gathered. Um, the other thing I need to mention is that most of this data would be um, empirical, empirically derived data, meaning through experimentation, yes? All right, now... That was some measurement. I was still talking about CTs. But for all purposes, the CTs that we are interested in, we are looking to use them to monitor systems under fault. And so we need to consider um, um, protection CTs. Not, not, you know, we spend all this time talking about measurement CTs. All right? Um, which means, therefore, that they will have to operate above normal operating current. So the CTs, they are in the system. They are monitoring the, the load of 500 amperes. If you, and we are trying your best to forget it, but for the power system's final exam, yeah, where you had the load current, then you have the minimum fault, and then you have the maximum fault current. What we have is that the CT would have to be as accurate and operating normally when just the load is flowing. When the current increases, whether as a result of minimum or maximum fault, the CT will still have to provide an accurate output. So, CTs use of fault will have to deal with um, those, those, those huge variations um, in, 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 in current. And so what, what is determined for these special CTs is what is known as the accuracy limit current. So it's the maximum current that the CT will carry. Yes? And then, of course, the accuracy limit current to the rated current 
That ratio yes, is known as the accuracy limit factor. Because we're dealing with an electromagnetic device, it will provide accuracy up to a point. And that limiting point, it, from a current standpoint, is known as the accuracy limit current. And from the 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 the, the well, in terms of, of the ratio, we give we know that as the accuracy limit factor. And that we def we describe or define as or show as Huh? At one hundred percent rated rated burden, yes, we have two classes. Remember, we're still talking about the British standard, yeah. We have two classes. We have five p and ten p. So for the current error, we have one and three percent. Remember, for the measuring, we were telling you what was happening between ten and twenty. 20 to 100, 100 to 120. For your um, protection CTs, yes? This is at 100% a rated burden. And for your current error, we have one and three percent. The face displacement, 60%. And the composite error. Remember we spoke about the composite error, which are a combination of all of that. These are given as 5 and 10 percent. All right? And the, the accuracy limit factors, the standard values are 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30. So having said all of that, all right, what, what I want you to, what we now need to look at is, you know, how do we identify these DCTs? So for your measuring um, CTs, what you have, so you have a CT, 15VA, class 0 0.5, yes? So you know that the rated burden is 15 volt amperes, and the class is 0 0.5. So that's what you'd see on the CT. If you want to know what all of this means, then you go back, well, you'd have the data sheet, but we can go back and we see that as 0 0.5 CT. Yep, a 0 0.5 CT. Has a percentage current or a current error of 1%, um, up to 20, etc. etc. All right, and then the rate, as we said, the rated burden as shown is 15, 15 volt amperes. So if I had a um, 20 VA class 0 0.1, yes, the class would tell, give me an indication of what the arrows are like. 20 VA would give me the rated burden for the CT. Okay? For your, for your protective, protection C, CTs, the little more information that is given, based on what we, we said here, for your protection CTs, you have 10 VA class 10 P10. Rated burden. Yes. 10 P. From the 10 P, you'd know what the errors are. Yes. And then 
you then have the accuracy limit factor. So you know the ratio of the limit current to the the um, the rated current. So this is telling you that if you have the CT, uh, oh, if the if the CT is five hundred to five, it's so a five hundred to five CT. And you have 10 VA class, 10 P10. Then what it is saying to you is that that 500 amperes, if you had 10 times the 500 amperes on the primary side, which of course will give you, give you 50 on the secondary. If you had that, yes, then the error specified would be limited to what is in the table. And based on your operation, based on what you want, want, want the CT to, to, uh, to be used for, you will select that one. All right. And all of that is in the notes. Um, so I, I you know, figure you just jot down um, while I hopefully continue to provide some clarity. All right, I suppose we can now, I can now officially say that Mr. Reed has left. Okay. Now, excuse me, sir, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, well. On the previous slide, the, 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 is it the first number or the second number is the because on the yeah. table it, on the table it says the which, which one of these is the accuracy limit factor? The accuracy limit factor is the last number. Oh, oh. Okay. So the 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 ten P oops, oops, oops. The ten P yeah, I'm still playing with, with this toy. The ten P we tell you the accuracy, the um, class. So it's class 10p, from which you would get the errors, and the 10 gives you the limit factor. All right? Thank, thank you. Mm. So we can have CTs for general use, which um, their operation is defined by the knee point. Right? And by knee point, um, that's the point on the curve where, you know, if you think of magnetizing a piece of material, and of course, I, I'm sure you would, you would have gone through the cycles um, for a magnetic cycle. And you're familiar with, with what we talk about, hysteresis loop, right? Yes or no? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. It's no, off it, but I, I, I know that that probably learned it. So it's not at the back of my head. Okay. That's great. You, you know what I mean by we talk about hysteresis loop? Say, I've heard the term before, but I'm not quite sure. So, is it like a B? I'm, sure. I'm going down the line now, Mr. Darby. By the way, Mr. Darby, where are you with So, you can hear me? Simply. So, um, I don't, I'm not sure. I uninstalled a driver on my laptop because the touch is acting up, so I guess it, this is. Alright, so, alright. Talk about small hysteresis loop. Familiar with the term? I heard the term already, but I'm not exactly sure. I heard the term. How about the Mr. Vakala? Uh, no, sir. No. All right. Yeah, this is what we looked like this before. Yes, sir. Good for me, Adam. And the axes are B and H. Yes. Yes, sir. All right. 
So that first one that goes up there, huh? Yeah, obviously, my sketching skills need improvement, but anyway. So we call this is cycles of magnetism. All right. A cycle of magnetism means that you, you magnetize a, a piece of material by mm -hmm. increasing the current in one direction. Yep. Um, you remove the current. When you bring it to zero, you still have some residual magnetism in it. Yeah. Um, and that we refer to as the um, Roman influx. Yep. And then, of course, you reverse reverse the current and then all the current you use in the reverse to remove the residual flux yes um it's known as a coercive force now the thinner your hysteresis loop is it means that the the law is retentivity in other words in other words when you magnetize that piece of material, if you have a thin hysteresis loop or a narrow hysteresis loop, it means that when you magnetize that material and you remove the field, remove it from the field, it will lose most of its magnetism. Right? If the, if the loop is wider, it means that it retains more of it, its magnetism. But at the same time, if it's longer, it just means that you need more current in the reverse direction to remove whatever residual magnetism it has. So when you think of, for example, the operation of your transformer, yeah, your transformer, ideally you want it to retain some magnetism, yes? Um, so when you, when you um, de-energize the transformer, you want some magnetism to remain in the core, because if you don't, when you re-energize, it's going to then take significant amount of inrush current and it will impact your protection system. But that's for a lesson several weeks away. All right? I, I tell you, this is, my, this is what I like. So I tend to go off tangent. Um, I don't know who I'm going to hire to keep me on track. The spirit of like you want to sleep or what's wrong there. Anyway. <laughs> so... This is what the, the magnetizing curve looks like. What you are saying is that there comes a point where you run into, into saturation. Eh? Or you're heading towards saturation. And that, oh, come on. That point where, where increasing the, 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 the current by an additional 50%, will only give you a small increase, 10% increase in EMF, all right? So initially, starting from zero, as you were increasing the current, you saw that the excitation voltage was increasing. When it gets to that point, which we call the knee point, where if we, if we increase the current by a further 50%, we'll only get 10% increase in output voltage. So in other words, it's now getting towards saturation. Okay? So that knee point, very, very important. And you're going to hear it again um, as, as we, we, we continue through this. And transformers, CTs that are based on their knee points are referred to our called class X CTs. So everything we have just spoken about uh, um, is related to the, to the um, British system. So we have the measurement CTs, yes. We have the protection CTs, that's a 10p, 5p, and of course we have the class X CTs. All right. Um, but now we have to talk about the um, the fact that CTs. have to respond under abnormal conditions. And just like um, what you would have learned for regular circuits, regular operation of magnetic circuits, you can drive a CT into saturation. And if it then saturates, 
If it's saturated, it means that it will not be giving you an accurate replica of what's happening on the system, which means that the relays that are supposed to be the brains of the system will be running blind because they will be getting inaccurate information. All right? So we know, we know that, um, that CTs, uh, this is, this is a problem. And my equation is just going very up. But anyway, um, <laughs> you have the derivation in your in 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 your in your notes. Yes. You guys have the formulas in your notes. Talk to me. Are you looking at it? Yes, sir. All right. So it's not in the presentation. Um, but I'll just I'll just speak to it anyway. So you would have had IP, yes, your, your uh, primary current, um, being a function of the the, 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 the the voltage and the resistance and inductance of the system, all right, on the system. Um, of course, one of the things we, we, we need to bear in mind is that in your power system, especially for your lines, well, your power system generally, the inductance is much larger than your resistance. And so um, one standard angular measure that we, we, we take is that the angular displacement between the two is, um, is in the 70, 78 degrees. I will speak to the importance of that at a later time. But the... the, the the flux within, or well, before I even get the flux, what you have, the composite um, current expression consists of both steady state and transient. Yes? The transient component, um, based on what we have already gone through networks too, we know that that will be um, identified with the, the exponent. So I'm gonna use that, that symbol. Um, identification right so the exponent the e to the minus r r t over l right so that's the transient component so we have the transient and this and the steady state and of course um if you scroll down when we're in power systems what we do is to always try to look at worst case scenarios yeah why do I mention that? In your worst case, you want to look at what the maximum, what happens with when the maximum transient um, occurs. In fault analysis, one of the reasons why we use the subtransient reactants, remember we said when we were looking at, at fault analysis, we said the, the, the positive sequence reactants is given by is, is equal to the subtransient reactants. Okay, remember we said that. The reason for, for doing that is that that is the lowest value of reactants that the machine will experience during fault. So the, the, the smallest value of reactants will correspond to the largest current. Similarly, when we're looking now at what's happening on the system uh, with respect to um, the fault and the response of the CTs to that, the maximum transient will occur when um, the sign component is equal to one. Or in other words, when alpha minus beta is equal to 90 degrees or pi over two. Okay? So if you look back at the formula, for the um, steady state and the transient, the maximum transient occurs when the sign, because of course, since it is uh, cycling, yeah, it must it must peak at the top of the sign curve. So we're looking at at first swing. As a matter of fact, some of the thought analysis that we you know 
I will give you the exercises. You'll have the program. You'll have access to it for a month or two after the course, if you're interested. Um, I'll send you some exercises that deals with um, things like uh, uh, like stability, system stability. You know how to test the stability of a system. Where you can um, play with those exercises if you feel to continue learning from you by the after they are, they are finished. But anyway, um, so the, the maximum flux occurs on first swing because thereafter it's on, it's in the envelope. Right, it's in the exponential envelope. So at 90 degrees, this occurs. And so we have an expression now for your for your current. And uh, we make some assumptions regarding the, the the excitation current. Yes. And then you touch back a little of what um, you would have learned in, in, in magnetics. Yes. Um, where we have that the flux is a function of the, the, the voltage, all right? We do that integral, and what we are left with, which is where I am at with this formula that is not showing properly, is that phi c, it's not showing up phi, that phi c, yes, is equal to phi a plus phi b, which is equal to phi a into 1 plus x over r. Now, you don't have to try and remember the derivation. That was just to bring it through the process of saying, of, of, of pointing out that the flux within the system is not only dependent on, 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 on the, the current CT itself. That's the key thing. The flux that the CT has to deal with is not dependent on just um, the, 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 the flux produced within its core by virtue of its normal operation, but it also has to consider the reactance and resistance of the system to which it is connected. Why do I mention that? When you go into industry, whereas, whereas we in school tell you about the, um, the, the, the reactance and the resistance of the transformer, what you, what you may get is the reactance of the transformer but you also get the x to r ratio. All right, so you get the reactance, but you get the x to r ratio. So you never need to consider the x to r ratio in determining the, 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 the size of the CT that you are going to use as part of the system for protection. Now, I know, I know, that I'm delving into a lot of design stuff. And you may say, but hold on, I'm not going out to design a power system. Fine, that may be true. But things happen. And, and you may need to go out there and do some replacements. I'm seeking out that you make contact. So then again, you may decide that you want to go help Canada become populated. I don't know. And then you all do that. And so, if you decide to go populate Canada, then maybe you need to go and do some designs of power systems for some air, some remote areas. Yeah. But, Mark, I'm not encouraging it. I don't know why I can get that from take that out of the recording. But anyway, it's already out there. So I'll suffer the consequence. All right. So the, the x to r, x to r ratio is um, derived from the system to which the, the, the equipment uh, is, is protected. And this has to be given consideration um, within, within the design. All right? Okay. Which is, so this is the key point that you need to, to note along with, with this. All right? So, 
so we now come to the American standard. But I will pause if you have any questions or you. No? All right. All right. So you see the, your, your American standard. The American standard, um, the, the, the ANSI IEEE, yes, we have two groups. We have the class T and the class C. And I'll tell you that most of our work will be focused on the class C, C, T. You, a wound CT is typically a class T, or the bar or bushing type are class C. Right? And uh, in terms of the operating curves, you have the diagrams already. So we just highlight it. This is your class T. Right? Um, Yeah, there's not much I want to say about this, but that's a class T. We're not going to be spending any time really. I shouldn't have said most, but we're not really going to be focusing on the class T, C, T. Now, important uh, bits now. Now, class C, C, T um, is des uh, designated, um, followed by the secondary terminal voltage. And that voltage is VGH. Now, it's the, what you need to what you need to be able to do is to determine or identify VGH. All right. Before we get to that, this is the voltage that the CT can deliver to a standard burden at twenty times the rated secondary current without exceeding a ten percent ratio error. That's a big ball for you. Let's break it down. Remember, we said, what were the standard outputs for CTs? What are the standard secondary currents for CTs? Um, I don't know. 5 All right, good. And we said, what did we say about the one? Mostly using Europe. And it's hard news, eh? So, technically speaking, when we talk about 20 times the rated secondary part, all we are saying, yes, is that your class C CTs can deliver to a standard burden at, and what will be 20 times the rated on the secondary? What be 20 times the rated? What is that? 100. 100. 100. Exactly. That's all we are saying. So it will, it will be able to deliver, or it produces that output. And the current, the, um, the, 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 the ratio error, or the error in the, in the CT will not exceed your 10%. All right, now that simplifies everything about the CT, unlike all that we went through with the British standard, because there are just a few standard burden values that we have in terms of impedance. All right, so before I get to the second point, let me just highlight um, the issue with VGH. So, VGH note is this value. Is voltage at that point. You remember earlier when we were looking at ES, the secondary voltage, we were looking at the voltage across RS and the relay. Maybe I should use a different color there. I don't think I have to be Yes. Right. So we're looking at ES, it was the voltage across R and, and, and the relay. VGH is the voltage 
after the secondary. So it's the voltage across the relay and the associated connecting wires. So it does not consider the secondary resistance of the CT. So that's VGH. And that is what you need to focus on. Never forget that. All right? Let's talk also about the um, other aspects of, 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 of our CT. Remember when we look just now, at the class X, we spoke about the knee point. We also have knee point for your class C T. And I'm going to the mechanics. Ah, beautiful. Yeah. So if you look at the top, you see a point right here. That's a tangent for this. Alright? And we have A. And over here, we have B. And note, B has these dotted lines. Can we see that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're you able to see it clearly on, on the diagram that you have, right? Yes, sir. All right, good. So let's look at some other stuff. You see, on the CT, I'm going to be talking about VGH. There are some other things on these um, characteristic curves that I wanted to take note of. And of course, we did look at these characteristic curves in power systems, but you know, we left out some of the details. Note you have here VEF, and you have here IE. Let's go back to the... Uh, where am I? Okay, so let's erase this. All right, so VEF, we're going to vote right across the excitation line. And IE, with a current there. So you have IE flowing into the excitation winding, you have VEF and you have VGH. All right, so VEF, that's at, at the core, and IE will be the current flowing into it. Okay, there are things we need to know. What we have here is a multi ratio class C CT. So, multi ratio, these are the ratios. All right, so if you're looking on the, the one at the bottom, would be 100 to 5. So you basically have taps. These are tap positions on the CT. So you can buy that one CT and you use it for uh, one uh, one application. And then you know you have a, a higher current application elsewhere, and you may use it for that. You know if you if you need to uh, remove it from from use. So it's a multi ratio CT. So if you're not 100% sure of what ratio you're going to use, even though you should calculate this for your purchase, um, you'll have a multi-ratio. On the top left-hand side, what you have are the RS values. So if you go back to the figure, these are the values that they're, they're getting. So that's, those are the RS values. So for each ratio, you get a certain resistance. So in your calculations, if you are using the 100 to 5, then the um, secondary resistance is 0 0.05 ohms. If you're using the 800 to 5, then it's 0.41. Right? Because remember, all you're doing is tapping the winding at different points. 
So you, if, if it's a 1200 to 5, it means that they're using all of the winding. So you have a higher resistance. All right? Okay, folks? So I've told you everything I need to tell you about these, these curves. And you're going to be using them um, going forward. So now, we're now going to make two definitions which you need to know and need to remember. Huh? So the first one is for your ANSI IEEE knee point. To get the ANSI IEEE, you have this 45 degree this line. Oh, come on. Man. You have, you have, all right. So you have this line. And it is drawn at 45 degrees and it's tangential wherever it hits the, the tangent of that 45 hits the curve. So in, in this instance, it hits it at A. Remember the point A that we were showing earlier? At that point A, that would be our ANSI IEEE knee point. The IET, IEC, sorry, <laughs> the Electoral, uh, International Electrotechnical uh, Commission, the IEC knee point, is the intersection of straight lines extended from the saturated and unsaturated points on the curve. Let's explain that one. So for this, all right, let, me, let me use the curve at the, at the bottom, the 100 to 5. So the unsaturated and saturated. The unsaturated would be um, this line. So you simply extend it. All right? And the saturated would be this line. And you simply extend it. And where the two of them meet, that's the knee point. So that's what B represents. So at the knee point, yes, it will tell you what the excitation uh, current would be. So it will tell you what the excitation current would be. And it will tell you what VEF would be equal to. So you get two bits of information at that knee point, all right? And we, are, we, are, we will be able to say um, or, or say some things. I won't go into more detail than that. We can say some things about the, the CT based on those, on, on, on these knee points. So I can either ask you to make an, a, an assessment of the CT based on the ANSI IEEE, which means that you use that 45 degree, yeah? And wherever it hits, wherever it hits the curve, at, at a tangent to the curve, then that's your ANSI IEEE. For the IEC, you extend the saturated and unsaturated until they intersect, yes. Um, sir, can you know, just say oh. 105 curve and go to that 45 degree tangent again? Go again? You can use the same 105 curve and go to and do the 45? Yes, sir. All right. I can't draw it. However, you would have the, you would have the, um, you, you would have your ruler. And you said square. You 
You see, I pursued me. I, I went to school and those things were in high heels. But everything was, uh, you yeah, know, graphics on a computer. So you have one of two choices. You could simply draw a line parallel because this 45 degree line, this line would always be on the curves. So you simply get uh, something, um, get your ruler, your set square, get the set square. All right, let, let, let me let me let me erase this and, and try and I'll show you what to do. Okay, so your set square, this would be your ruler, yeah? and then you set your, your 45 set square, and that it would be like that. So that's your set square. You see? Right? And then you simply okay. slide it along the ruler. And when you slide it, you get a line parallel to that 45. And so you get another 45, you know? so that's there. And where it hits the tangent. Where that tangent hits, then that's the knee point. It's difficult for me to show you on, on the screen, but if we were in person that I could, you know, get the the, the, the actor um, instruments and show it to you. I, I, get, I get what you're saying, yeah. So you just get one parallel to what is already there and um, and there is. Sir, a question. Um, yes. For the IEC, the knee point is not necessarily on the curve itself? No, it's not. Okay. So the, the knee point here, yes, would be giving you a VEF value and an, and an IE value, right? Which is, as you write, this is not necessarily on the curve. But it's how, it can't be on the curve to be on, to be on here. It's, it's not on the curve because you are extending the saturated. So you're assuming that it is, um, unsaturated or saturated and unsaturated so it will be above the curve so it's really an approximation for the IEC all right one other question okay. yeah um what standard what what I think the standard is do you mean in terms of the number yes sir or the name that's a very good question uh I don't know. No. So remember, we, we spoke earlier about the standard burden for the class CCT, right? The standard burden B1 is one ohm. We have two ohm, four, eight. So these are the standard burdens. One, two, four, and eight. And based on what we said earlier, the standard voltage classes would be 1 times 100 amps. This times 100 amps. So we get 200 volts. Huh? And so for, the, for your class CCTs, in terms of, in terms of how we, um, we represent them, huh? the class C. CTs. Wow. It's denoted by C with the um, output voltage. So you have a C200. So what that is saying is that that CT can give you a maximum of 200 volts at 20 times the rated current. Or in other words, at 100 amperes. So at 100 amperes, it will give you a maximum voltage at 200. 
Yes? So the, the curves for your CTs, similarly, you'll have C200, C400, C8, and C1. Those are the four. All right? Um, and in terms of, of the curves, for the one ohm, yeah, the two, and remember I just spoke about the designation. So you have the C8, C4, C2, and C1. All right. Now, remember, we, we gave the formula earlier for ES, where we say it was um, IS into RS plus uh, the relay. Uh, for VGH, in terms of our calculations, what we have to take into consideration is VGH is equal to IS into ZLD plus ZR. ZLD, of course, is just the connecting leads, and ZR, um, the relays, whatever, is connected to the CT. Now, what you will find is that because of the high currents that we're dealing with, and because of the level of accuracy that, 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 that we require, the, the connecting wires, because remember, all your CTs are out there, they're on the, um, they're on the line, yes? They are on the transformer, you with it? They are they're on the bus bars. So the CTs are, 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 are far distances from your relay house, from where the relay is, yes? And so you are going to have to know carry a um, couple of pairs from all of that back to the relay house, which is why we have to give some credence to the um, impedance of the connecting wires. We can't just ignore it. We can't come to this with a long parameter circuit um, outlook. We have to now consider the connecting wires because that impedance is going to compete with the impedance of the relay, especially given the types of relays that we now use. All right. And then finally, on, the, on this topic, just coming back now. So the VGH is across here. Yeah, and um, GEF is here, VGH, the connecting leads, times IS, and VEF, IS times RS, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Any, question, any further questions? Any questions? Are we good? All right, good. Now, to be honest with you, you know, um, I am going to I am going to push on this evening. Uh, uh, are you tired or can we move up? Or can we continue? This is just six twenty-two. We can continue for the other half hour, even though it's very gone in darkness, and we can't see her anymore. Um, is that a sign? No, sir. Sir, could give me like a minute, sir? Can turn the lights. So, can I push on, gentlemen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. All right, so what I want to do is to uh, 
let's see how, let's see how. We're going to the... Uh, I don't know the the extent of the, inform of the information that is in your uh, in your in your folder. However, let me just open another document here. Uh, all right so what i'm gonna what i'm gonna look at is what we we refer to as well what we we're gonna um start broadcast okay okay so we want to look at CT selection. Okay. You believe that I am in, I'm from the commerce department. Thank you. All right, so we talk about CT selection uh, and performance evaluation for phase funds. Okay, so a lot of what we just spoke about, we'll, we'll um, go through it in this, in looking at whether or not a CT can handle a particular operation. All right? Okay, so. Well, some of the things I, I mentioned, we have not gotten into it as yet in terms of looking at how, how relays operate, yeah? But, you know, uh, yes, my students, you'll catch up. Yeah. So in terms of how we select uh, relays or, you know, how they operate, that's all based on the type of fault we're monitoring, yeah? Um, so phase relays are set based on three phase faults. And we we'll, would we'll then talk about ground relays. These are set based on single phase to ground faults, which is part of the reason you have to understand you know, how to calculate these and what would be the difference in, in the relationship between the, the currents and the voltages, etc., etc., with these different fault types. So we're going to go through a, a phase fault. Um, and this is a scenario that we are giving. Okay? That's a scenario. Where we have a network, the maximum load is 90 amperes. The single phase fault current, 350, and the three phase fault current, 2500. And we want to select a CT and evaluate its performance to see whether or not um, it is satisfactory. Okay? Or it can, can do the, the task for which we, we have made a selection. So let's get started. Then again, in terms of the relay information, you have already done that in core system, so that's good. Can we do the introductory thing? So you, you remember the words that pick up current and all that stuff, right? Yeah, good. Can I move on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so the first step. Um, we want to select a CT that will not operate um, for the maximum load. So we, we choose the 100 to 5. Right, so we are choosing this arbitrary. Hmm? So the, the, the ratio is 20. 
who comes from the 155 CT. So we haven't chosen that. We then look at the maximum load. And at the maximum load, the, the um, secondary current will be 4.5 amperes. So I'm going to then make a selection in terms of the, 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 uh, the relay, yeah? which would not result in operation on minimum load. Or on maximum load. What am I talking about? Okay, okay, I need to go. Anyway, so the first step is to select the CT ratio that will not result in really operation for maximum load. So we now come to the relay. Yeah? And as we mentioned before, as you have already been um, exposed to, the tap represents the minimum people for operating current. For an overcurrent relay. And the top selected should be just higher than the maximum load. Okay. So if we select a top of five, then the ratio above load is 10%. So we get 1.1. 1 .1. And yes, I know I am eating a few decimal places. So don't preach to me. I know. Right? But it is 10%. Alright, so 1.1. Having done that, having done that, well, I see people right, so I just pause on it. And that that one percent, I'm gonna I would have gone to my relay and look at the available taps. These are the available taps. Obviously, there's no 4.5. If I select four, yes, then that would be too low because the 4.5 amperes based on the the the, 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 the turn duration that I'm using, the 4.5 would cause it to operate. So I select five, which is the next best. So I can operate up to 10%. So it can carry me up to 99 amperes before it really operates. All right? Everybody comfortable with that so far? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I want to look at what output I will get on the maximum, on the minimum um, fall current. So the minimum fall current we get 3.5 that's 3.5 that makes that is not supposed to be there. It's 3.5 which is given by the 350 which was the minimum current over 20 which gives us 7.5 17.5, and when we divide that 17.5 by 5, we get 3.5. Remember the top that we selected was 5. Alright. So we look at what happens with minimum. Yes? We get the 3.5. Now, how we go about getting the burden? That is information that we would have to gather from the from the the the, 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 the relay itself, eh? All right. So to get the, the 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 burden for the CT, I would have to know what the burden that the relay will present. Eh? So as I said. The, the information about the relay would then give me the CT burden because remember the burden is what we connect at the output of the CT. Yes? Now, for your static relays, you could get a burden of, let's just say, one ohm. And it remains the same throughout the operation. But with your electromechanical relay, 
Yes, that which is really just like the old down. Um, and power meters, the one the rotating this, yes, um, with those relays, depending on the secondary current. So depending on what's coming from the CT, the burden is going to change. So if it's a static relay, microprocessor relay, which is what um, you would you, you, um, be exposed to, yep. then we're talking about fixed values, otherwise, we are going to have the, the secondary current dictating the relay verb. Okay, so we come back to this. And remember what we're trying to determine is VGH, right? We're trying to determine VGH. We need to determine what it is, whether or not this CT can indeed handle the sort of um, currents that we are going to pass through it. All right? So I'm giving you the, 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 the next bit of information. All right? So I'm giving you the next bit of information. All right? This is what you would have gotten from the relay. So the lead resistance, meaning the connecting wires, we have 0 0.4. Yeah? And um, for a secondary current of 5 amperes, the burden from the relay, from the electromechanical relay, is 2.64 volt amperes. But when we go up to 20 times the rated, it shuts up to 580 volt amperes. But because it's an electromagnetic device, of course, we're not going to get um, a linear relationship. So at five, it's not that, you know, 20 times that is going to give us 20 times 2.64. Right? So the, the, at the 100 amperes, we're now all the way up to 580 volt amperes. And we can calculate from this, we can calculate from this the impedance of the relay. So we can find the corresponding impedance. Let me pause because I know I'm going a little bit here. Are you following? If you're not, please tell me. I'm going to be pointing you there. I'm a bit confused that the the five eighty more than five eighty. Yeah, no, it's it's not linear, but I just don't know where the value can come from. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I said earlier. That's what I said it earlier. Let's go back there. Remember, I circled that the relays. So I said you would have gotten the burden associated with the relay. So this is something you would have from the data sheet of the relay. So if it was a static relay, then that burden value would be fixed. If we're dealing with an electromagnetic relay, maybe I should remove this from, 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 from the lecture because there are very few electromagnetic relays out there, but I have a duty to education. I don't know where you'll end up or what you, you, you interface with. All right? So I still have to put it there. All right? So I'm saying, with the electromagnetic relay, these are the bits of it. These are the data that you'll have to work with. At 5 amperes, 2.64 volt amperes. At 100 amperes, it will go up to 580. I also said that the data relating to electromagnetic um, uh, relays, that's derived empirically. So it's, it's something that you measure. So you'd have to get that from, well, obviously, you know, given the manufacturing process, you standardize and you know that you know, this relay will give you this. Yeah. So this is what you get from the manufacturer. 
Is that something that you would create? Having said that, you are then we are then able to determine what the total lead resistance or, or the total resistance to the terminals of the CT would be equal to. So I know based on what I just said, you 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 would see some surprising numbers. The wire between the CT and the and the uh, relay can't change. So the lead resistance would remain 0.4. We said that earlier. Right? There it is, 0.4. With the burden, however, with the 2.64 at 5 amperes, the burden impedance is 0 0.16, which gives me a total impedance from the secondary of the CT up to the up to the relay of 0 0.506. And if I were to consider the 580 at 100, it gives me 0 0.458 ohms. Yeah? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, and, um, you know, uh, well, I've said it already, but, you know, it, it's, it's here in the information. So, the first one at the five amperes, and then the others at 20 times, which is 100 amperes. All right. And this is the burden information for the relays, what you get from the manufacturers. We, we have already said that. Now we look at the performance of the CD. Yes? We, if we were using the, C, the, the class T, CT, if we're using the class C, T, we're using this T. Then we look at the performance curve. Yes? And determine whether or not um, the, the, the CT can operate. And we'll be looking at the um, the, 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 the current and the the, the, the normal secondary current, etc. 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 But as I said, we're not focusing on that. What we are focusing on is the class C C T. Alright. <clears throat> so we come back now to our, our, our diagram. And I think you have seen this figure of men up. Alright? So you can start drawing it in your sleep. Alright? And remember what we are focusing on. VGH. VGH is, 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 is the key. Alright. The CT that we are using, the CT that we are using is a class C one hundred six hundred to five CT. So it's a motor ratio 600 to 5 C100 CT. All right? And we are using the, we are using the 0.458. Yes? Because that would give us the lowest possible uh, voltage, and if it can handle that, then we know we are we are okay. We 
because also it is translating to the maximum um, current. This is the largest burden that they really would present to the CT. And with that burden, it means that um, if it can handle that, then it can handle uh, whatever is below that. So let's see. So the 25 at maximum, at maximum arm current, which is it, the fall current, the 2500. Yes? We have 2500 over 20. The 20 there comes from the 100 to 5 CT. And we're multiplying that by the, 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 the impedance to give us 57.25 volts. However, what CT was are we using? 600 to 5. Which top are we using? Which top on the CT are we using? So the 100 to 5. The 100 to 5. So if it is a 600 to 5, right? and remember how we defined the class C CT. We said that the, that number there, the 100, is the maximum voltage it can produce when um, 20 times the, the rated current is passing through it. Yes? So the 100 here is telling me that at 600 to 5, the maximum voltage is 100. So if I am using the 100 to 5 top, what would be the maximum voltage it can produce? Let me go again. The 600 to 5. Let's start at the definition. The definition of the C100 is that it can produce 100 volts. Yes? When 20 times the rated current is produced, it is passing through it. So if I am using the 100 to 5 top on this 600 to 5 CT, would you, would, what would be the maximum current uh, voltage that can be produced? Uh, how would you find it? Remember that top. Come on. It's not that difficult. You're tapping off a portion of the winding, you know. If the full winding can give you 100 volts, and you're tapping off at 100, what voltage would that correspond to? So we divide yeah, by 600 times 100. 100. Yeah. Okay. So if you, you, you divide it by, well, multiply it by 6. Yeah? Which is what we have here. So in other words, with this selection of 100 to 5 for that CT, it will only be able to produce 16 volts. However, with the maximum fault, it is required to produce 57.25 volts. Which means that this CT would not be able to accurately reproduce the maximum voltage. Well, or if you don't get that, let's, let's, let's continue with the analysis. So we have just had, we, 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 we just took 100 to 5 out of that, eh? We just pulled that out of that in here. Well, let me now choose another tap on the same CT and go through the analysis again. Because remember, you know, we have selected, what we are now doing is evaluating whether or not our selection is correct. Obviously, we are doing this, for use of a better word, we are doing it sort of blind. But with time, with experience, you would have known what selection to make. 
But you're going as a young engineer, then give the one work to you, just do it. So we're going in now. We're just are going to go a little faster because we know select 455. CMCT. So the terms ratio on the CT is 80. Ratio above load, 1.125. For a top. Sorry. For a top of 1.5. So my top is 1.5. And if we look back at our curve, we look back at the curve, right? We see that we have the 1.5 here. But with 90 over 80, this is the maximum load, we get 1.125. Don't sweat it, I guarantee you, you, because you have to go through all of this analysis, especially in lab number two, it, it will become crystal clear. Maybe a little fog, you know, don't worry about it. Don't be bother. But let's understand some of the basic principles. So if we go back to our curves, we have the 1.5. So let's look at the performance of the CT. Going through the same thing we just did. Overload margin means that the, 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 the equipment will have a margin of overload at 33%. On minimum fault, we had 3.5 before. Now it is 2.9. I don't know why I keep putting on these extra decimals, but anyway. All right. About 2.9. We have 350 over 80. We're dividing that by 1.5. So we see that in terms of multiplier on the minimum for not much has changed. 3.5 to start screaming, just take it, it is it is what it is. I am giving you now, in terms of the, 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 the relay, yes, I'm giving you this information. So, at this top, at this top setting, and at 20 times the burden, 20 times, the burden impedance is 1.56. So it has changed a little from the calculation. So whatever information I would have given you regarding the burden, you would have been able to use it to calculate that. So I'm giving you this burden information on this step. All right. With results, uh, which results in a maximum voltage. So your, your VGH that can be produced. Yes? Or the, the VGH that will be produced, that can, will be produced is 61.25 volts. But we are now, from the CT's standpoint, we are now on 400 to 5. And remember, at 600 to 5, it will produce 100 volts. So on the 400 to 5, it will now produce 4 over 6 times 100, which will give me 66.7 volts. So if we look at that, 
right? So that's the voltage that it can carry, the CT can handle, or it will produce on this tap. And in terms of in terms of what we calculated just now, given the burden information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when this fault occurs, this is the voltage VGH that will be um, created. So it means that on the 400 to 5 tap, we will be able to operate the relay. So that's, that's evaluating the performance. So we selected it. And we have gone through the evaluation. All right. So go through this. Go, go back through it. Yes. Um, try to appreciate some of what we have, we have gone through. What we'll do when we meet next, well, we're meeting third tomorrow, right? Yes, so we have a class tomorrow. So at, at two o'clock, yeah? So we'll go through the evaluation using the curves. All right, so try and digest this tonight. We look at the curves, using the curves to carry out the analysis or to um, you know, provide some some uh, validation for what we have done here this evening. Okay. All right. Well, th that's it for me for tonight. Um. Yeah. So we're going through the bread and butter of the module right now. All right. Well, you know, we have to get the bread and butter before we start taking the gravy, eh? Yeah? So don't understand these hard work, but then, you know, we're going to be on some shaky foundation. So have a good night. Um, by the way, hold the labs. Hold the lab going. I know I'll talk to you about that on Friday, but okay with the program? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good. There's like Good. a slight difference between the bodies, but it doesn't matter. Slight is dangerous, so. Sir, I. <laughs> sir, like it's 0.001. Oh, alright, cool. Yeah, yeah, alright. We can't work with that. We can't work with that. Alright, good. Uh, have a good evening. Take care. Okay, see you. Yeah. Oh, cheers. <laughs>